of the 12th century because people discovered Aristotle at the time or rediscovered Aristotle. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit more about the development of science and particularly astronomy and mathematics. Uh, and these two fields, which are sort of apart today, in those days, of course, everybody was an expert on lots of different things. And I want to refer to a man who uh, did an enormous amount of work, but who is generally not known for it, even though he had a moving finger which wrote and continues to write. Uh, and he lived in Iran. His name is Omar Khayyam. And he was a very, very significant mathematician. Um, he also, uh, he did major work in algebra. Uh, and if you've ever studied or remember the algebra you learned in school, uh, he figured out how to solve cubic equations. And that's a hell of a hard thing to do. Um, but um, he also created a very accurate solar calendar. And this is back around 11-something, um, no, or, or, or even about 1090. And that calendar was still used in Iran as he wrote it up to 1920, and still is used in Iran with only very slight modifications made to it. That's eight or nine hundred years that he's made something that, uh, that's lasted. Quite a remarkable man. Um, in the, there were, of course, uh, considerable work, there was considerable work done in lots of fields, uh, and particularly, as I've shown here, in spherical geometry. And I'll just point out that in flat space, in two-dimensional space, the three angles of a triangle must always add up to 180 degrees. Perhaps some of you can cast your minds back to enough geometry to remember that. But on a sphere in three dimensions, that's not necessarily true. So here is a, a triangle based uh, on the Earth, and it, the two longitudes which are 90 degrees apart at the North Pole and reach the uh, equator at 90 degrees. And so this is 90 degrees, and that's 90 degrees, and that's 90 degrees. And so the three angles add up to 270 degrees, and, and they can add up to anything virtually. So it's a different world. It's an interesting one. Um, almost all this, the, the work done in mathematics and astronomy was done either in southern Europe or in the Middle East. Um, and there was a gradual splitting of thought between Jewish thinkers and Muslim thinkers, who were uh, the, the primary people. There was uh, mathematics done by some significant uh, thinkers, such as uh, Abraham ben Chia, um, and who did algebra and wrote a complete solution for the uh, um, quadratic equation x squared plus ax plus b equals zero. Um, the, um, in Christian Europe, there was very little original work done, but there was, of course, a lot of translation, as I've mentioned, uh, from uh, Greek in, in, in uh, from Arabic, rather, into Latin. And there were translations on geometry, on algebra, and arithmetic. Arithmetic continued largely to use Roman numerals, but with some uh, uh, in, uh, introduction of, of uh, Hindu numerals. On um, there was a lot of use made uh, in, in astronomy using the astrolabe to measure angles. Um, and scientific apparatus in those days was really lovely. Uh, made there is a, a, a 12th century astrolabe uh, from somewhere in Spain. Um, aside, the only other um, languages in use really beside medieval Latin was medieval French and strangely enough Icelandic. The Icelandic sagas had been written a century or so before, but there was still a lot of intellectual ferment on that island, and there was a lot of work done in Icelandic. Um, and it's a language today. Um, it, it is, of course, a Scandinavian language, like Danish, Swedish, Norwegian. 
um, but it's the same as it was a thousand years ago, and so Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians cannot understand it at all. Um, there were translations, particularly of Archimedes, which, which turned, uh, who was um, such a superb thinker that he is considered still by historians of science to be the equivalent of Newton and Einstein. Um, one of the three greatest minds uh, of, of all time in science. Um, but I want to leave the, the, this incredible ferment of the 12th century, but with a standard <laughs> um, pedantic, pedantic complaint that this should be a year's worth of lectures and not just uh, five or six, uh, uh, as the case may be. The, the 12th century is such a time of ferment, um, such an amazing uh, period of, of um, human endeavor. Um, the 13th century, um, but what happened in the 12th century, the, the reintroduction the of science as it was, or was, as it was called then, the reintroduction of Aristotle, lasted from the 12th century up until the beginning of the 18th. And that is, it lasted up until Isaac Newton. And that's a hugely long time that Aristotle had intellectual supremacy, much longer than, than the 300 years uh, we have had of, of science since, since Newton. Um, the 13th century worked on contradictions among all these ancient authors. There were contradictions between Aristotle, Ptolemy, Galen, and, and then the Arab uh, commentators, Averroes and Avicenna. Um, and these changes uh, came more uh, from observations and not from experiments, and, but a little bit from the, the introduction of the use of mathematics and certainly from better technologies. The um, introduction and, and integration of Aristotle's works into the Latin West during the 12th and 13th centuries is, as I said, amongst the most amazing happenings, most remarkable happens, happenings in European uh, intellectual history. It, it was not only philosophy, but also it was because of his writings on medicine, which of course mattered a lot. Um, and this pagan Greek was adaptable to the, to the needs of medieval Christian theology. And the needs were, of course, religious, but they were also medical because um, of the uh, introdu or the extension of the human lifespan, which became possible. Uh, Aristotle's logic became a, a, a major tool in all fields that, it, that required any sort of learned argument. Uh, his work, of course, is, is challenging, and, and I still find it difficult to, to understand. But a lot of help was gained from the writings of people like Avicenna and, and Averroes. Um, both of those two men, one in Spain, or in Al-Andalus, as it was called, because Andalusia is a, or Andalusia, I guess you're supposed to say, uh, is an Arabic word, uh, and in, in uh, the other in the, in the Middle East, they were outstanding philosophers themselves, and they were deeply involved with Aristotelian thought. They were themselves authors of medical texts, and um, the desire, as I said, for medical knowledge brought a lot of, of um, writings on, on nature uh, to the Latin world. Science in the 13th century was dominated by what I talked about yesterday, Aristotle's conception of substance. So I need to talk a little bit about philosophy today, not as much as yesterday. Scientific investigation in Aristotle's thought involved induction. That is, he started with facts perceived through his, the senses. And today, of course, we know that the real world that we see through our senses has, is, is completely divorced from reality. 
um, the, the universe, the real world, the world of the molecules and atoms could not be more different from what we understand in our size. And the, the galactic world, the world of the universe, is extraordinarily different from anything. We humans have a very limited uh, imagination. Um, so, but Aristotle used his senses and then we used induction to generalize, uh, to come to what he calls universal forms. And remember a little bit, I spoke about forms on Monday a, a wee bit. These forms are the real identity of a substance that stays the same through changes such as boiling or condensation. So if we talk about water in all of its three forms, ice, liquid, and gas, uh, and we would uh, talk about that as the molecule H2O, uh, the one chemical formula that everybody in the world seems to know somehow, uh, that that, um, but that's not what, I mean, obviously they did not know about that. They did not even know about atoms. But the real identity of a substance persisted through changes. Um, Aristotle described the discovery of forms, again by induction, which is more or less by guessing. Um, he made abstractions from sensory data, and, and this revealed three different forms of reality. These corresponded to physics or natural science, to mathematics, and to metaphysics. And these changes in motion and the nature of material things, uh, this corresponded to, to what, what he called physics. Um, but mathematics was abstracted from matter uh, and um, considered the attributes of material things, but metaphysics considered immaterial things Things could uh, the the um, Im, Im, immaterial stuff with uh, what I call independent existence. So Aristotle then has these three categories, and they don't mix. So only things in motion could be considered as science, but things at rest were part of of either um, metaphysics or mathematics. And this distinction that he made can be seen by his uh, very biased ideas about how things are born. Um, this is a very male-centered theory, uh, and I apologize, I guess, for Mr. Aristotle. What he said is that the female of a species um, contributes no ovum or germ, to, uh, to, but only passive matter from which the embryo is formed. He calls this the material cause. The efficient cause is the male seed, which starts growth. And it carries to the female matter the specific form of the animal that it would take. And this form is the final cause, the form of the adult animal. Of course, this is all wrong. Um, Changes of any kind, Aristotle explained on the same principle. Attributes which had become potential became a a actual. Lunar eclipses, for example, were not the sun passing in front of the, the moon or the, or, or the moon in the shadow of the earth, but in fact were part of the moon's substance. Um, and this idea of substance was the basis of natural explanation again for 500 years. Um, time, he said, could have no limit to it, existed forever. And this, of course, uh, was very different from the Christian thought, which was that the universe was very young and would die very soon, should have died in the year 1000, but didn't for some reason. Um, but despite these differences, he was still deeply accepted. He said that you could divide a material body into smaller and smaller parts forever, 
um, but you couldn't see them or couldn't really find them. But you couldn't expand forever because the universe was rather small and, and, um, and, and quite finite. Um, there was, of course, a, a considerable difference between Aristotle, which was rediscovered basically in the 12th century, and Neoplatonism, which had existed since 300 of the Common Era. And um, they disagreed with one another, and as people are wont to do, they disagreed often quite violently. So the Arab thinkers, like Averroes and Avicenna, um, were Neoplatonists, but uh, there were other thinkers, such as uh, the Rabbi, of, Rabbi of Sebron, who, who thought that, who was a Neoplatonist, and thought that every material uh, object had an attribute which caused it to be extended. I like to have, uh, this is of a Sebron. Um, I like that. Uh, so some of his, um, some of his Satan sayings are very cogent even today. Um, the, one of the two people I like best because of their names, one was Simplicius, I like that name very much. The other is Robert Fathead, or Grossa Testa, um, who was born in the 12th century but did all of his work in the 13th. And he was one of the Aristotelian scholastics to really begin to understand Aristotle. And he was the teacher of Roger Bacon, whom we will talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, and he was the first person to, to reason from particulars to general laws, and then Lou used those laws to work backwards to particulars, which is in some sense what science does, although he was far from a scientist. For him, light had the, which, was the cause of all extension, because if you have a point of light, it moves in all directions, of course. Um, so that for him, the laws of geometrical optics um, were the foundation of all physical reality. And mathematics, he was the first person to put mathematics together with any kind of physics. Mathematics was essential to the understanding of nature. Um, he had really a metaphysics uh, of light, so that he said, for instance, color was incorporated into an object. It was part of an object, and you could only see it when light was, from an external source was shown on that and reflected from it, and then the color uh, became uh, apparent. Um, crazy stuff, but you know. Um, and he used this uh, in, in, in a metaphor for theological arguments because we contained within ourselves a certain amount of truth, but it was only when we were illuminated by God's light that this became apparent and we could see it. So theology mattered an enormous amount. Um, yes? Robert Grossetesta. Robert Grossetesta. Yeah, G R O double -S, S E T E S T E. Grossetesta. Fat head in Latin. Uh, that's why I like his name so much. Um, his reputation largely lies in his use of mathematics with, with uh, observation or with science. Um, and he had a theory uh, of putting theology and metaphysics together also. Um, but again, these people, these medieval thinkers, invented ideas with no proof or no verification, just as the Greeks did. It's conjecture, it's not science. Um, but he taught himself Greek, uh, 
and made the first translation of one of Aristotle's most significant works, the Nicomachean Ethics, and he translated that into Latin. Um, recall that I said that the education was really seven liberal arts, the trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and then that prepared you for the quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And the quadrivium was then pre preparatory work for the study of philosophy, uh, the, the liberal art par excellence, and of theology, which you needed all of this to study. That's all there was to education. The use of mathematics to explain the physical world which is the central problem of natural science, did not exist. But with Newton, it took its rightful place and, um, and such that mathematics is the language that nature speaks. For Aristotle, was, there was a strict separation of mathematics and physics geometry considered the formal cause of things, and moving causes were only the prerogative of physics. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about individual sciences. And because of the limitation of time, I'm just going to choose sciences I know something about. And we'll start with cosmology. Uh, Aristotle's cosmology dominated much of European thought in the 13th century. And it was founded, of course, as I've said so many times, on naive observations and on common sense. Um, certainly, we have learned, if with nothing else in science, that common sense is not very common. Um, and nor does it make much sense. Um, but his philosophy was based on two fundamental principles. One, that the behavior of things was determined by what I called the, their forms or their natures. And two, the total effect of these natures formed a hierarchically ordered cosmos. Um, and so uh, I have here a picture of the universe. Okay? Here is Earth in the middle, and it is surrounded by spheres of uh, air and uh, of water and then of air and then of fire. And after that come the uh, orbits of the, the, the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Eunice, and Saturn. Uh, and so uh, we have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spheres for the seven objects in the sky. After that comes the uh, a sphere of the stars, the fixed stars. And after that comes this um, peculiar thing, which was put in by Christians because of the statement in, um, uh, in Genesis, which said, God made the expanse and separated the waters beneath it from the waters above, and it was so. And so this is the, our, where the waters above are located, and it was put there for that. And beyond that is the prima mobile, or the prime mover, and it is this by some very indefinite ar uh, arguments that causes all of the rotations of this. So this somehow rotates, nobody seems to know how, and that rotation, because all of these crystal spheres on which these ride are in contact, and so this pushes everything around. Outside of this is the empire of, of the heavens um, occupied by God and all of the elected, the saints. And so this is inaccessible until you die, if you're lucky. Um, The existence of these crystal spheres was deeply damaged in 1572 and noticed by Tycho Brahe, whom we will talk about tomorrow, 
namely, a new star appeared. That star was a, 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 a supernova, of course, but they weren't supposed to appear. Moreover, these are crystal spheres, but there are comets that are seen, and they were originally thought to be part of the fire, but again, Bra has showed that they were very far away. How could they get through crystal spheres? And this realm of the stars was supposed to be perfect, yet suddenly a new star was born. Uh, and that led Braha to his interest in the heavens, and uh, as we will see, to tremendously accurate measurements, and then finally to um, an acceptance of Copernicus's theory, Galileo and Newton. On Earth, there was four basic elements, earth, air, fire, water, and they moved according to their natures, earth and water down, air and fire up, and they, um, the, everything else moved for violent reasons, and motion was caused by the sun as it moved around the ecliptic, uh, and it generated growth and decay of animals and, and plants, but all changes in the universe really came from this prime mover. And that, um, except for Grossa Testa, there was a serious conflict between physics and mathematics in the 13th century. With the physical ideas of those of Aristotle, motion being ascribed to this prime mover, um, and from there to all other objects. But the mathematical models were those of Ptolemy, which everybody exist, uh, knew was a perfectly mathematical, not, not any relation to reality. <clears throat> um, but um, it was necessary to explain or to give an explanation to what really, really happened in the heavens. It was not a physical description, uh, but Aristotle knew that not everything moved in perfect circles, but he believed so much in, in, in perfect circles that he made that true anyway. He knew that, that, with the, that motion was not in circles. He knew that the outer planets had this retrograde motion where sometimes they move along and stop, turn around and go back, and then go forward again. Um, <clears throat> and even though he knew that, he said, the hell with that, I'm, I'm, I'm making my theory. Um, but he did try to make things a little bit more accurate. And to do that, he adopted uh, an idea from an, uh, a, a, an astronomer about whom we know very little, Eudoxus, uh, and in which the sphere on which the planet, uh, or the circle on which the planet went around also rotated about the axis going through the Earth. Some attempt, um, pretty fake, to try to make it look uh, a little bit better. One of, of course, there were so many major obvious weaknesses uh, of, of this system. Um, because in a, in a, if objects move in a circle, they were always at the same distance from the Earth. Yet the planets, um, which move, of course, around the sun in elliptical orbits, sometimes were brighter and sometimes were fainter uh, in the sky. The um, moon is sometimes looks bigger and sometimes looks smaller. And solar eclipses are sometimes total and sometimes annular, so you can see a ring of sunlight around. Um, and, um, but Eudoxus, who tried to explain a little bit, his work, is, as I said, is lost. Um, Ptolemy's system in, uh, of this mathematical system in which he has a deferent or a circle on which things move, but he has an epicycle, a circle based on a circle on which the planet moves, and even so, the Earth is not at the very center, but is off center a bit, and this is all an attempt to 
to try to explain what you actually see putting the Earth in the middle. Uh, and this had really been done well before Ptolemy by a Greek named Hipparchus, who lived some 200 years before Ptolemy was born, but much of his work is lost. Now, probably the most interesting thing that happened in the 13th century in, in, in astronomy was the creation of the Alphonsine tables. King Alfonso X of Castile, he had been born in Toledo and became king, but his father uh, had discovered in Cordoba and in, in, in Seville uh, translations uh, of data and uh, of, of planetary positions. And so Alphonsine asked the, the um, people of his time uh, a collection of Muslims, Christians, and Jews uh, from, from Spain at the time to make up a table of the predictions of where the planets and, would, and the moon uh, would be at different times. And these tables were enormously important, and they were used throughout Europe from the early 14th century until 1551, that is about 250 years. At that time, a new set called the Prutenic Tables we'll talk about were composed by a German astronomer named Reinhold. Um, but these tables were of crucial importance during the Renaissance, and they were used by Copernicus. Um, and it provided also the data used in the Gregorian calendar creation in the 1580s, the calendar we still use today. Um, now, I want to come to three of the greatest thinkers of the 13th century, the first of whom is Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great. Um, he was born as Albert von Bolstedt in Schwabia, somewhere between Stuttgart and Munich. Uh, he studied in Padova. He became a Dominican monk in 1223. He taught in various German schools, taught in Paris from 1245 to 48. One of his students there was Thomas Aquinas. Um, he taught again in Cologne from 1248 to 54, was sent to the papal court in 1256 to defend the teachings of Dominicans against the, uh, the University of Paris. And notice that these people were completely fluent in Latin, German, Italian, and French, and they could teach in back and forth in any of these languages. He knew no Greek or Arabic, but by his time, all of Aristotle had been translated into Latin, and of course, he could read that. Um, he made a very serious study of Aristotle and also of Plato's Timaeus, and wrote lengthy treatises on every subject which intellectuals considered in those days, theology, philosophy, natural science, but never mathematics. Um, his philosophical works are largely Aristotelian with some introduction of, of Muslim and Jewish sources, uh, and he depended heavily on interpretations by Averroes and, and Maimonides. Um, he was probably the best naturalist uh, of the Middle Ages and the person who understood more about plants and animals than anybody from the Greek Pliny to, um, to the 16th century. The second thinker I want to talk about briefly is Roger Bacon, has no relation to Francis Bacon who lived hundreds of years later. Uh, he was English and a Franciscan, not a Dominican. Both the Franciscans and the Dominicans were fairly new orders of monks, started in the 12th century. Um, and they very quickly became very antagonistic to one another rather than uh, theological compatriots. Um, he studied under Grossetesta and became a Franciscan about 1250. But he got into trouble uh, with his superiors, and they censored his works. Um, then Pope Clement the, the, the Fourth um, asked for copies of his works in secret, but then Clement died, 
and Clement's successors really didn't like Bacon because Clement liked him, and uh, therefore he was arrested and imprisoned from 1278 to 1292. That's 14 years, and he died shortly thereafter. Because he was a Franciscan, he was a very strong critic of scholasticism, which was primarily Dominican, and that made him a real enemy of, of the Aristotelians. Um, he insisted on the utility of knowledge, and probably more clearly than anyone else in his, in his time, he saw the usefulness of experimentation. Um, he was really disliked by Albertus Magnus and eventually by Thomas Aquinas, but he also had a very difficult personality and was what the French would likely call a mauvais coucheur, um, which is sort of, I don't know quite how to translate it. It's an awkward customer, which he was indeed. Um, but he had many remarkable visions. Uh, even though these things were impossible. For example, he considered the possibility of circumnavigating the, go the globe, so much for flat earth theories of the world, which some of us were taught in grammar school that people actually believed, which is not true at all. Um, he also thought of propelling boats by mechanical means, by flying, uh, by taking advantage of the explosive properties of gunpowder, and of, um, uh, of glasses to improve sight. Um, none of these could he do, of course, but they were remarkable visions for one person to have. Now, I want to come to the third figure of importance, and that is Thomas of Aquinas. Uh, <clears throat> he's a very significant figure, of course, born into a noble family in Italy in 1225, somewhere between Rome and Naples. His parents wanted to send him to the um, to Monte Cassino to become a, 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 um, a Benedictine monk, but he was more uh, interested uh, in, in going to Paris and, st uh, and joining the rather much newer Dominican order, uh, which was founded, as I said, only a few years before his birth. So he went to Paris and studied with Albertus Magnus, and then in his early 20s, he went with Albertus to Cologne, uh, and then returned to Paris in 1252 and became a master of theology and taught in Italy until 68, when he returned again to teach in Paris and went back to Naples in 1272. Um, <clears throat> he lived only 49 years, but managed to become one of the great thinkers of his time, uh, so much so that he was canonized in 1323, a mere 49 years after his death. He was called by the church Doctor Angelicus Communis Universalis. And <clears throat> he was, of course, deeply influenced by Aristotle, as all the Dominicans were. Uh, and he wrote two extremely famous works called in Latin Summa Theologi Theologia and Summa Contra Gentilis, uh, the word summa comes from the Latin su superus, meaning above or higher than theology, etc. Um, in his studies of natural philosophy and of Aristotle, Aquinas was heavily influenced as by, as were so many of his times, by Avicenna, by Averroes, and by Maimonides, despite the fact that he, like so many of his time, was deeply anti-Muslim and deeply uh, anti-Semitic. Um, he was accused of following Averroes, who had been declared uh, illegal, um, but he was certainly influenced by Averroes, and I guess it's certainly possible, and he was not a follower, but it is certainly possible, I guess, to be influenced by people with whom you disagree. For Aquinas, and he's different in many ways, God is the author of all truths, including those which may be discovered by our reason alone, including truths about nature. Nothing, he said, can contradict the truths of God and scripture. 
any such conflict must be due to an improper use of reason or a misunderstanding of faith or both. But the truths, of, truths about God, that he exists and is the creators of all things, these truths can be discovered by reason alone. Faith is an Im, illumination of the, of the intellect so there can be no radical disjunction between faith and reason. Faith needs the knowledge that reason provides. I was looking for pictures of Aquinas. They're very hard to find. Uh, here's one of my favorite that comes from a copy of the um, Divine Comedy. So there's Aquinas and Albertus Magnus in heaven. There's Dante and Beatrice and Seven Die. I like this picture a lot. Seven doctor, Doctors of the Church. Um, he had no doubt that humans are able to know the world and to some smaller extent to know God. Such knowledge comes of two kinds. Self-evident truths, basic definitions such as the definition of a line or a point for geometry, and scientific knowledge which is the result of demonstrations. Not experiments, but demonstrations. He was crucially aware of the difference between Aristotelian cosmology and Ptolemaic models, even though these were often confused in, in his time. The former, of course, seeks to discover the nature of the universe. The second, Ptolemy, is only a mathematical model. Aquinas distinguished between creation and change. Natural sciences study the world of change, and a self-evident self principle of change is that something cannot come from nothing. All change requires some underlying material reality. Creation, however, is a concept of metaphysics and theology, and, and science, natural science has no, no comment on such. Uh, he also dealt a lot with biology and psychology. I'll ignore all that. On a more personal note, nobody ever claimed that um, Aquinas got famous on his looks. He was colossally fat. Uh, he suffered from edema, which was called dropsy in his day. And he had one huge eye, which dwarfed the other eye. Uh, he did not cut a particularly dynamic or charismatic figure. I looked for pictures of him, and I could only find one rather flattering picture in which he's not dedicated as a saint. Um, and he's, this is a great deal handsomer than he apparently really was. Um, He certainly was never apparently a particularly dynamic or charismatic figure. His um, fellow students in, 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 um, at university called him the dumb ox uh, because he was silent most of the time. And when he did speak, uh, it was completely unrelated to, what, to, to the conversation. Um, but this is in some conflict. Because even in the 20th century, a Catholic thinker such as G.K. Chesterton, a very significant man, uh, claimed that Aquinas could levitate despite being fat. Uh, and during such a levitation, the Virgin Mary appeared to him one time with the really good news, the happy news, that he would never be a bishop. Uh, but just <laughs> uh, During one such ecstasy in the year 1273, the year before he died, he became absolutely silent and said one word finally, all I have written seems as straw to me. And this, the Summa Theologica, Theologica is unfinished because of, of that. Now, he was on his way from Italy on the back of a donkey uh, to a council in Lyon in 1274, 
a council that had been designed to try to put Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity, which had split in 1054, to try to put them back together. On riding on his donkey, uh, he banged his head on a tree branch, was badly hurt, taken to the Monte Cassino uh, monastery where he recovered, started again, but he became ill, was taken this time to a nearby Cistercian monastery, and died in March of 1274. The last person from the 12th century I want to talk about is John Duns Scotus. Uh, somewhere I have a picture of him. Duns Scotus. Um, sorry? Yeah, I am. I know, I don't want to, I've got things I don't want you to see yet. <laughs> uh, he's the last 13th century person I want to, to, to describe. Um, unlike Aquinas, who was a Dominican, he being English, uh, Scottish, excuse me, not English, uh, was a Franciscan, as was Bacon, who was English. Uh, and, um, the Dominicans were deeply influenced by Aristotle, but the Franciscans were, were really much more Neoplatonist. Um, the, um, as befits his name, John was born in the town of Duns in, in 1265, and this is a town which still exists just across the Scottish border from England. Um, he was probably the most important philosophical uh, commentator of his order and a very strong critic of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and of course, these differences were accentuated by the intense rivalry between Dominicans and, and Franciscans. Um, as an illustration, uh, I talk about the idea of the Immaculate Conception. Now, um, Scotus, for the Franciscans, supported the idea of the Immaculate Conception, while the, the Dominicans uh, opposed it. If you're not familiar with, with that, it has nothing to do with Jesus. It has to do with the, the birth of Mary, who was either born as Jesus was without sin or not born without sin. And that was a controversy in the Catholic Church from the time of, of the 13th century until 1854, a long time, when it was settled by Pope Pius IX and settled in favor of the Franciscans. Mary was born without sin, and this is do now Catholic dogma. Scotus's major works were uh, comments on, on the, the Italian um, um, Peter Lombard and an attempt to make theology into some sort of science. Um, he tried to be reasonably well informed, um, but, uh, and he was deeply influenced by Averroes and Maimonides, uh, and uh, even by Avicebron, who I mentioned just before, uh, earlier today. Um, these influences were very powerful and really had a strong influence on, on um, Giordano Bruno, who I mentioned was burnt at the stake as a heretic in 1600. Uh, but he was very bitterly anti-intellectual and contributed strongly to the divorce between philosophy and theology. Uh, he and later Scotists were the strongest fighters against um, scholasticism. With uh, the Renaissance, there was a deep rejection of philosophical ideas, and so such ideas and their supporters, such as Scotus, were deeply rejected, and by the end of the 16th century, they were symbols of, of scorn. And so he had a lasting influence on the English language because a 
of his name. A dunce man is the origin of the word, English word dunce, or a person uh, who in those days was a, sp uh, a hair-splitting reasoner. Uh, they were regarded in the Renaissance as people who wondered how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, something that they never discussed, of course. Um, amongst his particularly worst characteristics, Duns Scotus was famous as probably the most anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic uh, person of the Middle Ages. He favored not only the forcible baptism of children, but the forcible baptism of their parents as well, which even Thomas Aquinas uh, denounced. Um, now, William of Ockham was born in the town of Ockham in England, now Woking, if you know where that is, just southwest of, of London. He was also a Franciscan, and he took Franciscan tradition in a completely new direction. He was what we would call an empiricist. He had contributed to the ideas of logical induction by uh, saying that the certain, the, the causal laws were guaranteed by the universe, uniformity of nature. And he took this um, as, there's a statement of Don Scotus, guaranteed by the uniformity. The only certain knowledge is gained by looking at individual things and only propagations about individual things apprehended by the science by the si senses or real science. All the rest are just concepts. And of course, what he is most famously known for is Occam's razor. And now, this statement had also been made well before him by both Grossetesta and by Don Scotus, who all said it was futile to work with more entities, entities when it's possible to work with fewer. Nonetheless, a plurality must not be associated without necessity. That is, don't use more than you actually need to use in any arg argument. Occam's attacked what passed for physics in his time, and he tried to destroy many of the principles on which 13th century physics was, was based. Relations between objects such as one object being above. After all, in Aristotle's theory, Earth was at the center, and therefore water was above that. So above had an absolute meaning. And he said, but that's nonsense. If I have two objects, one above the other, and I stand on my head, above and below are change place. Um, he obviously was much more of a, a, a realist. And his ideas led to the idea that all motion is relative. And Im this is implicit in physics from the days of Newton. He also said it's impossible to be certain about causal connections, for we know only of individual objects and events, and never of the relation between them uh, as cause and effect. He made revolutionary statements about motion. Uh, he talked about the uh, motion of a projectile, for example, which we know uh, does not push the air out in front of it and then the air comes around to the back and pushes it along, but that it has what Newton calls inertia. Once put in motion, things stay in motion until a force usually friction, stops them. And he came closer than any other medieval thinker uh, to that idea. He, um, and of course, it's direct contradiction with Aristotle. Um, he died in Munich in 1347, and many of his concepts were adopted by the last two people I want to talk about, which I won't do, but I'll just mention because of the time. Uh, they were two Frenchmen, Jean Bourridon, um, who was born near Calais, um, and 
understood what the way things really work, but because theology said that the earth is at the center um, and is not moving, he uh, accepted that. And the 